these are just some experiments that I ran over the holiday break. Uh, there are a bunch of questions that keep coming up about sparsity and dimensionality. So I wanted to just run a few experiments just to get some uh, results and I have some initial results. I don't, don't think I have anything definitive yet, but, uh, but the basic idea is, you know, as the title says, how low can we go with sparsity? Um, and so specifically, um, you know, it's a study of uh, dimensionality and sparsity um, in the context of uh, deep network, specifically the GSC network. And um, so the agenda is I'll talk about some of the questions I'd like to answer that I keep getting asked all the time. Um, I'll talk about the network experiment design, and then I'll show some results first with networks that only have sparse weights and then networks that have both sparse weights and sparse activations. Okay. Uh, why does it keep doing that? Okay. So questions we should answer, or I'd like to answer. Um, so the high level thing is, so we have a whole bunch of intuitions and math around SDRs from uh, the, our neuroscience work. And the question is, how well do these translate to deep learning networks? And I tried to address this in the House of Dense paper, you know, so some of the stuff around uh, robustness and, and things like that. Um, and I showed some of the uh, scaling laws for scalar vectors as well. But we didn't really uh, look at the question of dimensionality um, and scaling in the context of sort of full uh, deep learning networks. So the question is, you know, do we have natural scaling laws for sparsity in, in deep learning? I mean, the same way that we have intuitions uh, for SDRs. Um, a big question that keeps coming up is as we increase dimensionality, can we get sparser and sparser networks uh, while maintaining accuracy? Um, how is accuracy impacted in general by sparsity and dimensionality? Um, uh, if you have a, if you're given a budget of a given, you know, fixed number of non-zero weights or non-zero parameters, what's the best network size? Okay, is it better to have a small dense network, um, or is it actually better to have a really large, really sparse network? Okay, so that's, so these are all sort of variations of the same theme of looking at. How does dimensionality affect um, performance in, in, in deep networks? Um, our own research could benefit significantly from knowing some of these answers. And, and we haven't really hammered on dimensionality uh, much in our work. Um, it's difficult to have really sparse small networks for obvious reasons uh, that work well, because if it's just small it's, and you make it really sparse, you have hard, you know, you don't really end up having any weights or synapses. Um, from a performance side, from the architecture side, if you reduce the number of non-zero weights, uh, that's going to increase performance. Um, so to really do that, does this require increasing the dimensionality? Uh, is that what we actually have to do to, to get to the optimal performance? Uh, from a continual learning side, we know that increasing sparsity reduces interference. And so that should help improve, that should improve continual learning. Well, to do that, do we really need to increase dimensionality of networks? Um, in there. And again, you know, we haven't really hammered on this dimensionality question. Typically what we've done, like in the House of Dense paper, we trained a dense network that worked pretty well. And then we tried to sparsify uh, that dense network. We did a little bit with dimensionality and I'll show a couple of things, but we didn't really hammer on this dimensionality question. I think this is a really key question and it comes up in a lot of conversations that I have with, with other people. Um, and so some background, Results. Uh, this is kind of the typical chart we add with SDR math. This is actually in the context of scalar vectors, I think. But we can see that there are many different ways to do this. But when you do a, a vector dot product, uh, we know that the error decreases exponentially with the dimensionality. And sort of intuitively, what I've been telling people is you can the information content of a vector. If you're if you have a fixed budget of let's say exactly a non zeros. Uh, in a vector, the information content of that number of non-zero numbers increases as the dimensionality of the vector increases because the exact locations of where they are uh, are become more informative as the dimensionality increases. Um, here, we're just looking at the error when matching two vectors. We're not really looking at the context of a full deep network, so it's it's unclear how this would translate to a full deep network. Would we get curves, anything like this in a, in a deep network. 
Uh, with the temporal memory, we actually did this. Uh, this was a, from a poster at, at COSI in 2018. We buried the dimensionality and we looked at the sequence prediction error and we got nice curves that looked a lot like uh, you know what you'd expect from the math. And in the HTM side, this is completely not surprising because the SDR math was designed specifically to match what we did with uh, temporal memory and, and the spatial cooler. Okay, so, oh, oh, and the other thing that the only kind of hint that a result I had before was given in this table that I've shown a few times. Um, and this, these are results from the Google speech commands. If you look at the top two rows, we have accuracies for dense and sparse networks. So these, they both have roughly the same test score accuracy. But if you, if you look at the number of parameters of non-zero weights here, um, the dense network has many more weights than the sparse network. And I, I did a little bit of trying to create smaller versions of dense networks uh, to see if we can get uh, to answer this question, or do, are small dense work networks sufficient? And what I found, and I didn't really hammer on it, but what I found back then is if you try to make it much smaller, you really suffered in terms of accuracy. Okay, so this was very suggestive that uh, for some reason that, that, that dimensionality may be uh, uh, important here because the sparse and dense networks both had the same kind of roughly dimensionality. And if you try to reduce the dimensionality to get, get smaller dense networks, you suffered in accuracy. Okay, so this was kind of an intriguing thing, but again, back then I didn't really focus on it. Um, Isn't that what, kind of what we expect those to be? I mean, it, it is, it is. Um, it, yeah, you, we, we very much expect it from, from results like this. It's just mm -hmm. in the context of deep networks, there's all these nonlinearities and other things going on. Would we still get that? We didn't mm -hmm. really have uh, proof of that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, how low can we go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question. Um, so what I did is, you know, I, I should say this, I'm not claiming this, this is a huge results or anything like that. This is just something fun I wanted to do over the holidays and just try to get some answers because I keep getting asked this all the time and it would be really nice to have something a little more concrete to say. So what I did is a controlled experiment using the GSC networks. So the GSC network has two convolutional layers followed by a linear layer and an output layer. Um, and what I did is I varied the number of channels in the uh, CNN one. Uh, I varied the weight sparsity here and the number of neurons or channels in, in CNN two. I varied the weight sparsity here and I varied the number of neurons here. Okay. So by changing the number of neurons, you're increasing the dimension, you're changing the dimensionality of the vectors. And by varying the sparsity, you're changing the number of um, non-zero weights there are uh, and for each vector. Um, so this is roughly a five dimensional search space. <laughs> so it's pretty big. Um, and just for now, I kept these weights to be all dense uh, here and uh, these weights are all, all dense here. Um, Did you so vary the sparsity in the uh, in the in the layers, like in the you say you vary the number of channels, but it, do you also vary the number of like channels on, like the the K? Yeah, K I'll get to on. that. Yeah, yeah, I I, I did do that. Um, I didn't do it as exhaustively as I would <clears throat> like, but I did. I'll show you some results on that, um, and and that's explained here actually. So I guess it's more than a five. It's a six dimensional <laughs> or seven dimensional search space. So I have a, a dense network baseline where I created uh, dense networks of different sizes by varying uh, these three things. There was no, the weight sparsity was always 0% for the dense network, obviously. So there were 25 total configurations and I did four trials for each configuration just to take care of, care of randomness. So there were about a hundred total runs for the dense networks. For the sparse networks, there's a lot more because not only do I vary uh, the, the number of channels and sizes, but I also varied the weight sparsities, like I said. So there were actually 940 configurations. So I did about 3,700 total runs with, with sparse weights only. And then per Michelangelo's question, um, I, I did some stuff with sparse activations as well. So here I just kept the K winners to be 10% on for CNN2 and the linear layer. Um, and I 
I ran smaller numbers of configuration, 420 configurations here um, in 1680. So obviously this is not a complete exploration of the space. I, I can do better. This was just kind of what I ended up Did you doing. randomly pick points in the configuration space or did you have some systematic way of going through it? I did a systematic, like a grid search. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, I varied, it, it was like 64, 96, 128, so on. So I did a, like I tried to do a proper grid search, but it wasn't, it wasn't well, like for exact, example, it wasn't you, fully would you Would search. you increase the sparsity of the, the, the two theater and layers or, or would one, you know, were they being, change it in the same way each each trial or would maybe you left one more dense and all of them more sparse. Um, the following um, question. No, no, could you repeat that? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not exactly what you should mean by did a grid search, but like you're, you're varying the sparsity of these two CNN layers, right? Are yeah. you varying them together? Like they both are going to be going from sparse to less sparse or is maybe one's going to be sparse and one's going to be dense in one of these trials? I mean, all, all combinations. Okay, because that's- By grid search, I mean all the combinations. Okay, so that, that's a weird bit. I mean, it's like, there's, well, there's a huge space, as you pointed out. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's not clear to me, maybe, well, you'll, maybe you'll tell us your results. <laughs> so, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah and, and it is a big space. Uh, and I, that, that's, I just wanted to do something a little more exhaustive uh, uh, here. Yeah, you think like, a, you know, not, <laughs> like you did this on your, over the holidays, I'm not, I'm not complaining at all, but something more like a genetic algorithm might have, felt like, oh, this, this would be good for this type of thing. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and and to me, I was just trying to characterize the space. I wasn't trying yeah. to find the best Got points. Yeah. Uh, so if okay. I did a genetic algorithm or some other search space, I would do that if I want to really find the optimal points. Yeah, yeah. Here, yeah, I just sense. want to look at everything and just then analyze it. Okay, um, that's good. So it was a slightly different uh, yeah. thing. I didn't look at noise robustness at all. I just looked at accuracies. Um, was there a rationale for not having uh, uh, the K winners after the CNN one? No, um, I, this is a mistake I made actually. Um, so I should have CNN K winners after CNN one. Um, uh, and I was just trying to control the number of variations and I didn't think too hard about it. And as I was doing the graphs and stuff last couple of days, I realized that th th this is actually an issue. Um, it's a flaw in this design. And, and okay. it, I think it will actually affect the results. So, um, so I'm just giving you kind of a snapshot of where I am, um, just so my JIRA doesn't keep hanging around forever. And then I can, we can try doing a more, a better version of this later. Okay, so here's some results with sparse weights only. Um, and so no sparse activations or K winners here. Um, so these are kind of results for all of the, Trial. So the blue is the sparse weights only. And as a baseline, I have the, the orange is the dense networks. So obviously, and this is plotting the number of non-zero weights or non-zero parameters versus accuracy. And obviously the dense networks have many more non-zero parameters. They increase quite a bit. Um, and all of the sparse stuff is off to the left here because uh, they're very, you know, they're much smaller uh, non-zero numbers of non-zero parameters. And so something that was kind of interesting, which I did not expect. So you can see the accuracy of the dense network seems to tail off. Um, I, I should probably go even further out and I haven't yet, but what I found is you can see there's this like cloud of points whose accuracy is actually better than any of the dense networks. And yeah. I really did not expect that um, uh, because I, I didn't have that before in the, in the GSC stuff, but I hadn't really focused on dimensionality as much back then. So this was kind of, this was uh, uh, the first surprise. And so if you kind of zoom in, so I'm just zooming in on here now. Um, this is kind of all the sparse, the blue dots are all of the sparse networks with sparse weights only. The red dashed line is the best dense network. And you can see there are a lot of uh, points up here, including uh, some points with a pretty small number of non-zero parameters. Um, so that was that was pretty encouraging. So then I wanted to see how dimensionality kind of played into it. Uh, and I had a really hard time trying to, there's so many variables here. I was trying to figure out how to plot this stuff. Um, so what I came up with for now, and I want to find better metrics is I defined, because I wanted to have one axis, which is dimensionality and another axis, which is accuracy. So, but there are many 
ways that dimensionality is changing. And so what I did is I defined dimensionality as being the size of CNN, this should say CNN2, the CNN2 layer multiplied by the number of units in the in this L3, the linear layer, and take the square root of that. Uh, so that's what I, I defined the dimensionality as. Um, and this plot shows accuracy as a function of dimensionality by itself. Um, and you can see that uh, there's a clear trend here that as you get uh, higher dimensionality, the accuracy the, uh, improves. So this is each dot here is the best accuracy for a particular dimensionality that I, that I got averaged over four trials. Um, and so to get these really high values of 97 and a half percent, you have to be kind of in this range and, and they kind of and you can see the accuracy kind of obviously has to tail off at some point. Um, but uh, so this was kind of a, I, I expected something like this, but I did not expect these numbers to be better than the best dense network I had. Um, but you do see a clear trend improvement with, with dimensionality. So, so what happens with the, uh, uh, the sparsity, the weight sparsity on, on these things? Uh, uh, you, you had posed a question of if I have, in non zeros, uh, how do things work? How, how does that fit into your notion of dimensionality? Yeah, um, I, I'll, yeah, that's a good question. I think that's the next, is that the next slide? Yeah, All right. uh, I, I looked at it um, in, in this way. This is kind of more maybe a, a neuroscience centric view of it or an HTM centric view. So I looked at, um, if you look at a single neuron and look at the number of non zero weights that's on that neuron, um, how does, what does that look like? And I here, I now looked at only quote unquote good networks. So I, I, I only looked at the networks that were at least as good as the best dense network. Okay, so I threw out everything else. And what these charts show is the number of weights per neuron in the CNN2 layer. And this is the number of weights per neuron in the linear layer as a function of dimensionality. Um, and it's noisy here. Um, and I can, exp I think I understand why it's noisy, but you can see there is kind of a trend down that as dimensionality increases, you can have fewer number of non-zero weights per neuron, but it does seem to kind of flatten out. It's a little hard to see, but it seems to kind of flatten out here. And the same thing here, there's a, there is a trend down as dimensionality increases, but it seemed to kind of it seems to kind of bottom out here, okay? Um, and so it's kind of suggestive, and we, we definitely saw this in HTMs and the, the, the math kind of is consistent with this, that there's a natural floor of like a, the number of non-zero weights you wanna have in a neuron below, which it's, it's really hard to get below that. Um, you can look at the linear layer, that might be something like, uh, you know, 20 to 30, non-zero weights per neuron. Uh, it's, it's hard to go below that and still get good results. Okay. Um, and so, so that was, that's interesting. That's consistent with my intuitions. Um, and, and that was good to see. And again, I'm not saying this is definitive, it's just suggestive. Um, the interesting thing per your question, Kevin, is that what this means is that if you can't go below a certain floor at Beyond here, if you start increasing dimensionality, you're just going to increase the total number of weights, right? Because if, if you need to have a minimum number of weights per neuron and you increase the number of neurons, you're not going to reduce the number of weights. You're going to increase the total number of weights. So there's but, but some like have, natural it, maximum here uh, in dimensionality. Beyond. Robustness. I'm sorry? The extra weight might help with noise robustness that you did not test. Yeah, I, I think that's right. They, it could help with robustness. It could help with some other things as well. Um, but, um, you know, at least in terms of these kind of questions and the question Kevin asked, there's some sort of natural uh, floor here. Okay. Um, and I think Jeff won't be surprised by this. This is what we expected in, uh, in, in, in HTMs as well. I guess the dimensionality that I think would be interesting is for for GSC, we're only looking for 12 categories, right? So is there, you know, 
Yeah, I imagine all of these curves would shift as the as the problem. Yeah, I, I was you, thinking the you, same thing. Right? Yeah. I didn't bring it up, but yeah, it, it what, what where you end up on the flat bar here seems like it would depend on what kind of data set you're working with. So. Uh, that I'm not uh, I'm not sure about that. It well, may be like a thing? natural like, floor here that uh, below but, which it's just the the noise just kind of any noise kind of overwhelms it. But 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 if you have more categories, you might you don't think it would shift to the right there, but. I mean, if this is a 12 category problem, is that what you said? Oh, I think it would shift to the right. I don't yeah. think it would shift up or down. No, no, no. I'm just saying where yeah. where the plateau with the desired maximum dimensionality could move to the right. Yes, exactly. More yeah, that, that I, I, think, I think that's what Kevin was saying. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. It basically, I, I mean, given the problem is trying to solve a dimensionality, there's some, you know, there's fundamentally some information beyond which it doesn't make any sense to add anything more to the, to the, to the problem. Yeah. It's, you know, the rest of it is, is going to be in the noise. So when you change the problem, you know, more categories or continuous learning or something like that, you know, everything shifts around, but it's yeah. just interesting to kind of compartmentalize the notion that okay, there is an ultimate limit here for this particular problem. You know, it's, yeah. it's not going to asymptotically go off forever. Yeah. Right. Which, yeah. I mean, in some sense, intuitively, obviously makes sense. Sure. You know, so sure. But it's, not, it's nice to see it reflected. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and it's interesting to see what, what numbers are actually, what it actually comes out of. And my, my conjecture is that this floor might not change. Like what this number is mm. might not change. Like if the problem gets harder, you still hit the same floor. It's just the dimensionality might be much higher. Um, mm. But so you the might weight, still get you're saying the weights, the weights per unit floor might stay about the same. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's that, and that's what we had in HTMs too. Yeah. What's yeah. In interesting? Well, linear layers are the kind of simplest, and it's kind of intriguing to me that this number seems to be kind of what we ended up with our dendrites as well. You know, kind of in the twenty to thirty range per per uh, per neuron, which is similar to what you get in active dendrites. Um, um, so that was kind of interesting side thing, but it does mean that you can't just keep increasing the dimensionality and forever expect to get fewer and fewer non-zero things. There's going to be some maximum point and beyond that, it's going to start increasing again. Uh, okay, so I'll show the same graphs again with sparse activations in there, K winners. And again, uh, I did not have K winners in the CNN one there, um, I only have it in CNN2 and linear layer. So this is, uh, I would say this thing is not complete. What this chart shows is kind of all the different configurations and plotting the number of non-zero parameters versus accuracy. And the red dots are the ones with sparse activations and sparse weights. Um, so I don't know if you can see, but it seems to me like the red cloud is shifted to the left a little bit compared to the blue cloud, just a, just a little bit. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, it seems pretty obvious. Okay. Maybe I'm uh, over interpreting it. <laughs> the, yeah, red cloud looks, the red cloud looks great. <laughs> yeah, the confounding factor is I didn't run as many red configurations as I did blue. So you'll see there's no, you know, none, none here. Yeah, but you can just look at the, the part of the curve where it's really sort of on the left side there, where it's, yeah. you know, that, that, yeah. it's definitely peaking earlier. I mean, it looks like the red dots are also plotted on top of the blue dots, which um, kind of the effect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I, actually, maybe I should have plotted the reverse order, so then it would be. Yeah, but you can still red. see plenty of red dots that are not. You know, yeah, maybe not. you can see the density. Yeah, and stuff. maybe it shifts a little bit. But I think uh, overall, it's hard to deny that it's a good result, right? Yeah, uh, at least it didn't get much worse. <laughs> that's good. Well, uh, some people. Uh, so th with, that's an interesting point, actually. So in in deep learning, very few uh, cases places that sparse activations and sparse weights. And when I was talking about this with machine learning people, they were surprised that it would even work at all if you had sparse activations and sparse weights. That seemed crazy to them. Huh. Um, but, Why is that? Why do you think they felt that way? Because I think the thinking is, well, if you have really sparse activations and really sparse weights, you're not going to find matches. And it's just, it's just a much harder space to train in. That was kind of the one viewpoint, I think. Hmm. Um, but anyway, maybe, so maybe I'm not understanding, but it seems to me that should be better. So yeah, so like, me, yeah, me too. So <laughs> I, I, I just say, from a machine learning standpoint, it's bizarre that we're having sparse activations and sparse weights from the conventional view. Mm -hmm. uh, 
yeah, well, I think what we discussed in the past that having uh, sparse activations create a very strange loss surface with it's not a smooth one with very with peaks and valleys. Yeah, and I think mean, that's the intuition behind you know people don't believe sparse activations are actually gonna work well in this sort of optimization problems we have. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, if one thing we've learned over the years is that our visualizations of these, um, um, you know, these peaks and valleys, these these high dimensional spaces are just totally intuitively wrong. You know, we, we imagine these things in two or three dimensions, but um, anyway, I think that's a weak argument. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm glad to see. It. I think it's clear that this is. A, it, 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 I wouldn't say it's clear that it's better, but you know, maybe we have to do more results. But yeah. it certainly, it's encouraging for this for, for starters. <laughs> yeah, and I'll show some more results along these lines here. Uh, some of these same charts here, you can see the accuracy versus dimensionality. Um, uh, either the red dots are the sparse weights, and you can see again that for for these low this this range that for the red dots seem to be higher than the blue dots. The absolute accuracy doesn't change if you look at the best overall sparse weights network and the best overall sparse weights and activations there the same, but um, this curve seems to, you know, uh, top out sooner than the blue, blue curve. Again, it's, it's, these are noisy things and there are a lot of problems with this experiment design, but you can kind of roughly see this. At least we're not making excuses why it looks the other way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, here's the kind of number of weights per neuron. Uh, again, to me, if I squint a little bit, it seems to me like the, um, the sparse activation stuff is a little bit better. It's, it's more clear, I think, in the CNN2 here. This, the orange dots are lower than the blue dots, the number of weights per neuron. Here in the linear layer, it's a little less clear, but you can see this curve uh, you know, it low, is lower than the blue curve here. It's, again, you have to blur your eyes a little bit here with these dots. Um, and then kind of finally, as a summary of kind of all the results, here's kind of the old results that I was showing um, here. And, and if you look at test score and number of parameters, um, here's the new results with sparse weights only. And I tried to pick a few different configurations. Um, so this top row kind of matches roughly the accuracies I saw here, but you can see now the number of uh, non-zero parameters are much lower than what I had before. It's about half. And that's because I'm going up to much higher dimensionality. Um, but if I'm willing to increase the number of parameters, I'm actually able to get significantly better accuracy than the best dense network, like a half a percent more. That's so amazing. That's, yeah, so that's, that was- that, uh, That's really great. Am I, am I interpreting that correctly? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I did not expect that at all. Um, and um, yeah, I didn't expect that when I came into this. And then if you look at the similar table with sparse weights and K winners, um, here it's much clearer. All of the, the parameters here are much smaller now with once you add K winners. So if you look at the best network that about, had about 97% accuracy, the, the smallest here is now 64,000. So that's a new record for <laughs> in, wow. our, in our little set of studies of yeah. the smallest number of non-zero parameters. Um, and you know you can correspondingly, you know you can get much better accuracy than the dense network and and lower number of parameters than if you had sparse weights only. So this is something um, I think Lucas had seen some results along these lines in, in some of the work he'd done with ResNet fifty, and so um, uh, and I'm seeing it uh, pretty clearly here as well that if you have sparse activations, you can actually end up with many fewer weights. Uh, which is which is pretty cool. I mean, is this your last slide? Uh, then I have some takeaways, I think. So. Okay, go ahead. Okay, the, well, first of all, there are a lot of problems with this. I'm the uh, first one <laughs> to acknowledge this. Um, the I didn't really spend too much time exploring the CNN one size much, which could have an impact. The thing that Kevin mentioned, I think, is actually a pretty big deal. I didn't have K winners at CNN one, which means actually the weights at CNN2 were getting dense output activation. So this could actually significantly impact the, the non-zeros in the CNN2 weights. So I should- Nothing really... here can make it worse, right? I mean, I mean- No, no, it couldn't make it, it worse. This uh, could make it better. 
yeah, yeah, it would, would make it better. Uh, I didn't have um, sparsity, sparse weights at the output layer. And that's kind of the con other side of this, the dimensionality of the linear layer, which is feeding into the output layer, could have more of an impact on the sparsity of the output layer. And as you get to like 2000 uh, you know, units in the output layer, and if you have 10, um, I'm sorry, 2000 units in the linear layer and you have 10 uh, output units, that's 20,000 weights there. That's a pretty significant chunk. And, you know, and that dimensionality could allow me to have much sparser output weights as well, which I didn't really look at here. Again, this is just exploring you know, a larger search space here, but again, that could uh, make things even better. Uh, this noise here, I could, I should have more trials for configuration on the F4. I think better charts, sometimes it was really hard to decide what dimensions to plot in here. So I tried to do the best I could, but I'm open to suggestions. I might need a better definition of dimensionality. I just tried to come up with something that I could plot on one axis uh, in here. And I think I'm still not 100% sure that the dense networks can't get to that 97.5%. Um, I think that needs more rigorous testing in here. Um, but overall, I came away pretty encouraged uh, by all this. So the summary is definitely dimensionality matters. Um, and the accuracy of sparse networks increases with dimensionality. Um, you know, can sparse high dimensional networks reach higher accuracy than dense networks? It seems like the answer is yes, um, but more work to be done there. There may be a natural floor to the number of weights you need per neuron, you know, regardless of dimensionality. And so once you reach this, then increasing dimensionality just increases the number of weights. Uh, this floor may be surprisingly <laughs> so close to biological numbers, which would be kind of bizarre to me, but um, uh, that would be kind of fun that happened. Uh, sparse weights and sparse activations lead to sparser overall networks. I think we have a new record for GSC and accuracy and size. Um, some uh, One takeaway is it's very tempting for us to do experiments with small dense networks or even small sparse networks. And it's okay for debugging, but we really shouldn't test our key properties that we're interested in with small networks. We really need to have the discipline to go with larger sparse networks. Is that just a, uh, an issue of the time it takes to run these experiments? Why would we? Yeah, why would... That, I think that's an uh, issue. It's just easier to look at stuff uh, with small networks and then you can get into this trap uh, over thinking, oh, something's not working or something's working one way or another, whereas you really need to make sure you test with large sparse networks. And we, we saw this with HTMs as well when we were initially doing it, there was a lot of pressure. I mean, I, I think the engineers just, or researchers just felt that they should only do small networks because it was faster and things like that. Yeah. And I remember you you making this point years ago that no, we really need to look at large networks uh, otherwise. Well, I'm just trying to understand what the obstacle here is. I mean, in some sense, it seems like, well, starting an experiment with large, uh, Sparse networks shouldn't be any harder than starting experiments with small dense networks, right? So, uh, and trust me, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's just, I think initially the tendency is okay, you're just trying to debug your experiment to find out if there's a code problem. Well, it's easier to look at these things if it's small. And then, okay, it's running mm. faster, and now I'm doing this. Okay, now I'm getting some charts, and I'm looking at things. And then you sort of forget that, <laughs> okay, we should just, we have to move to large networks. Yeah. There's also the issue of comparing against existing results. And so there's a pressure to do A-B comparisons, which yeah, is yeah. not always the right thing to do. Um, yeah. And so there are a lot of kind of things that naturally take you to working with small networks. And I think we should only s stick with small networks for a very brief period of time, just for pure code debugging. And then we have to jump to large networks, large sparse networks. I mean, but in theory, I mean, the large sparse network shouldn't take much more longer to run anyway, right? Because you've got, uh, in, you've got in, the, in the ideal yeah. world, yeah. But in, mm -hmm. in our world, all, all the GPUs and everything, everything runs. Yeah. Like yeah. Things. yeah so unfortunately, it does take longer. Yeah. Okay. Kevin's about to solve this, right? Kevin? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's something we'd like to fix. Yeah. Um, and of course, so, there's a lot more stuff. I can fix all the problems I talked about in the previous slide. Uh, you know, clearly we need to look at more complex networks like ResNet 50 and other things maybe. Um, 
I didn't look at how fast the network learns that that would be kind of, I have all the data that would be kind of interesting to look at this. Um, mm -hmm. It would be interesting to look at Michelangelo has been doing this visualizations on sparsity, sparse activations. It'd be kind of interesting to look at all of this. Anyway, there's a lot more that could be done here, but I thought I'd just stop it here and just share it with you guys and, and, and uh, decide what I, to do next. I, I have a slightly extemporaneous question when you were talking about the biological numbers uh, that, you know, the 20 to 40, you know, uh, kind of interesting range that we, we've been looking at. Is that conserved across mammals or uh, I'm just kind of curious if, if, if that number holds true for other than primates? Um, so this number is in biology, we would look at the number of synapses that would be on an active dendritic segment, and right. it's roughly 20 to 40, and the threshold is a lot lower, is around 10 or 10 or 12 or so. Right. But um, it, I'm sure it varies a little bit, but... Um, well, I don't even know where those numbers came good. from. Do you, I don't even know if those are coming from primates or coming from rodents. Uh, I think the... Yeah, I'm not sure. I think, I think mostly from rodents, probably. Yeah, so you were, you were phrasing it the opposite, Kevin, like, oh, does it apply? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think there's a lot of data on this. If you correct me if anyone else is, knows otherwise. I, you know, it's not like this. First of all, it's hard to actually determine these things in biological networks. And, um, and these are done with, you know, uh, slice preparations or whatever. And um, so it's not like there's a huge amount of data about this. Um, so... Um, but my assumption would be that it would be preserved. I, it's more of a mathematical thing. I don't, I, I don't see how it, be, how, it, how it could possibly be different. I mean, it could be, but I, I can't imagine to what benefit. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I think the math is really suggestive of this. Um, okay. Is that the natural so, floor here? So, also, so, I think so, there's, there's been some modeling of, excuse me, you know, you can model these stuff in like the neuron models, which are very detailed biological membrane models. And, and those come out about the same thing too. So, um, so anyway, I, I don't think it's a good answer to the question, but I'd be surprised if there was distinction. So, so if it so if it drops out of the mathematics, uh, and so we're you're seeing okay, here's an example. Now, the fact that we're looking at a comp, uh, uh, a problem that's trying to distinguish, you know, you know, phonemes, you know, uh, with with humans as as a kind of background uh, element to that. That just might be incidental. I mean, if you're fundamentally, you know, that that number has an information theoretic um, uh, fundamental basis, then you shouldn't expect that it would be surprising that you're matching the biological numbers because evolution yeah. has been running an experiment for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, the the ish, the one wild card is that here we're using 32 bit floating point numbers. So in theory, there could be a lot more information per number. Uh, so maybe you could argue that, oh, the number should be much smaller here because we're dealing with floating point. Whereas on sy in synapses, we assume binary or at least very coarse resolution there. Yeah. Yeah. And, just, and just to be complete here, um, there are many neurons in the brain that don't work like this at all. So, you know, um, this idea that there's dendritic spikes and that's we're talking about cortical neurons and not and a subset of them so um, there could be other things going on other parts of the brain so we, we know there are there's all, all kinds of neurons so but for the neurons in the cortex we're concerned about um, I assume it's a good guess yeah okay that's all I had so, uh, oh, uh, oh sorry Quick question: Did you use uh, Vernum for that, or the old framework? <laughs> I, I, the old framework, uh, there were some issues. I'm sorry, Vernon had some issues with it that Lewis just fixed. So I, I actually ran these in the in the framework I used for the How So Dense paper. But I'm going to port it over to the Vernon framework. Uh, I, I've already started that process because some of these would be much easier to do in Vernon actually. Because in the old framework, I couldn't have clusters. In, in Vernon, I can have a cluster of GPUs. And sometimes each of these things would take like 15, 20 hours to run because I could only run on one server. Whereas with Vernon, I could just get it done in a couple hours. So yeah, I, you, I, could I, run, you could run the other one in, in, in a cluster, just not distributed training. The Vernon will give you distributed training. 
Well, like the other one I five. couldn't run on, uh, is at least easily run on multiple, have a head node and multiple slave nodes. If I remember, uh, you, you could you just have to. It's just I had to work. Yeah, that that yeah. It, it was easier for me to just you know wait for you to fix Vernon and I'll just do it in Vernon. That's rather than mucking too much with the old code. Wait, can I ask a question? Yeah. I missed something earlier, sorry, but um, uh, that I should have I should have asked this earlier, but this is small. When you say you, uh, increasing the total non-zero weights um, or increasing the dimensionality increases total non-zero non weights, I'm assuming that's the dimensionality of the output channels, correct? Um, this or, is either uh, anything. It's just uh, increasing the number of neurons, whether it's the number of channels or the number of units in the linear layer. Uh, okay. Once you hit this floor, where you need, you know, some constant number of weights per neuron, at that point you can't get any sparser, even by increasing dimensionality. And in fact, if you increase dimensionality, you're just going to, because you're having more neurons, <laughs> and a constant number of weights per neuron, the total number of non-zero weights has to increase. But don't you set the number of non-zero weights though? Like uh, in the yeah, in the yeah you said it, but but the point is that if you go below that, you're not going to get good results. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. So if you if you say okay, I want I want good results, I'm not going to accept bad results. I'm going to get good results. At that point, there is a natural floor to the number of weights uh, you have per neuron that you that you can use, and if you go below that, then you won't get good results. Correct. 